part two of uh, Yang Mill's talk. It's about the mathematics, mathematicians' view of the standard model, really, of particle physics. So we're talking about symmetry. What's the mathematical description of symmetry? What a mathematician does is not so much to focus on the object or the system that's being transformed, um, modified in some way that hopefully is a symmetry, um, or even to look at one particular transformation. It's to look at the set of all of them. And in fact, what you know, the technical term is to call it a group of symmetries of the object. And look at how they combine to, to each other. Well, you can add symmetries. It's, it might seem funny to use this algebraic word add, but it's very similar to addition. Just do one after the other. So for example, um, let's just go back to this picture. Let's look at this square, and let's just rotate by 90 degrees, and then rotate by 180 degrees. What does that do in, in effect? It really is just one rotation by 270 degrees. And so anytime you do one thing, one operation that leaves the, the thing unchanged, like this square, and then do another one, it'll still be, it'll be in yet a new operation that leaves the thing unchanged. It'll be a new symmetry. So you can combine two symmetries to form a third symmetry. And you can think of it roughly like addition of numbers. In this case, you really get, it is really addition of numbers. 90 degrees plus 180 degrees is 270 degrees. And so in very special cases, it behaves very much like the algebra of ordinary real numbers. Um, and so it really is a generalization of adding. And what you get is a kind of algebra. And it's very productive to think of it in an abstract manner as a kind of algebra. It's actually the simplest kind of algebra, partly because, uh, like with real numbers, we're used to having to do addition and multiplication and figure out how they interact. Here, we just have one operation, and that is combine. Just do one after the other. You've got a bunch of, of things. The things you're doing are symmetries and um, these operations on, a, on some object, and you just do one after the other. And you don't have to worry about some other kind of thing, some other way to combine them. Um, and so it's in fact, if you take an abstract algebra course uh, in, uh, in college, this is almost always the kind of algebra you start with called group theory um, that encodes symmetries. So one really big distinction, sometimes the order that you do two operations doesn't matter. Like circle rotations, if you did the 90 rotation and then the 180, you get a 270 degree rotation. If you do the 180 rotation and then another 90, you still get a 270. It does not matter when you're rotating something in a plane um, what order you do it in. But often the order does matter. Very much unlike adding two numbers. It's what we say is it doesn't satisfy a commutative law, if that brings a bell from way back when. Um, so, for example, re reflections and rotations. Let's see if I can uh, look at this. If you reflect, let's say, take this point here and reflect about the vertical axis. That zips it over to here. And then rotate 90 degrees counterclockwise. That comes down to here. Okay, so remember that. Remember that we got down to here. Okay, I can't really mark it on the PowerPoint very well. Um, or inst but instead, we could rotate 90 degrees. We started here, remember. We could rotate 90 degrees to start with, counterclockwise, and then reflect. Oh, wait. If we reflect, we're not going to do anything. We're on the axis of reflection. So we end up here. That's very different from ending up down here. So when uh, even in the plane, if you combine reflections and rotations, you get non-commutative combination. Um, it's called non-abelian. is a fancy name for it. Three 3D rotations are another very important example uh, where the order does matter. If you take a book. And this illustri illustration indicates that we're rotating 90 degrees around a vertical axis. You get this orientation, and this F for, for front and B for back. The front is sort of toward this way. Then it's indicating rotate 90 degrees around this axis. So the book is straight uh, is up and down. The letter is straight up and down, and the back is is facing us, and the spine of the book is facing off towards us and to the right. Well, what if you start with the same orientation here for the book? You first do the what was the second rotation here? So you rotate it. Uh, it this pi over two means ninety degrees. It's a fancy way to say ninety degrees. Uh, ninety degrees around this axis, and now it's flat with the top of the book toward us. Now do that vertical rotation, which was the first operation in this sequence. You get a completely different orientation of the book. You can totally tell which sequence of operations has been done by looking at the final product. And so rotations in three dimensions 
do not commute with each other if you do rotations about different axes. If you always just use the same axis and you only rotate and don't reflect, yeah, they'll commute with each other. They, the order will not matter. But as soon as you get different axes, they don't commute. And that has some wonderful consequences, even for just sort of basic classical physics and in, in our understanding of the world. But um, one thing I want to go a little further in, in, in the idea of, of description, because uh, I want to mention one, I, I, I kind of want to mention a little bit more about this. Different objects often have the same group of symmetries. Our intuition says that if I know how to rotate a cylinder, and I kind of understand what that concept means, I, I know how to rotate a book. I know how to rotate my kid on a merry-go-round. I know how to rotate a lazy Susan in the, 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 the cupboard to find the, the spice I want. The people wouldn't say, oh, those are utterly different. They'd say, it's, it's, it's rotation. Rotation is rotation is rotation. But, but in what sense are they, are they the same? They're different objects in different places in the world doing different things. Well, mathematicians would say they satisfy the same formal rules. So even if you're acting in different settings, different objects, and really in different ways, like you're physically either moving it with your hand or some electromagnetic thing is rotating, whatever, if the same formal rules apply, then, um, then it's, it's, it's call, it deserves to be called rotation. So for example, one of those formal rules is try to figure out, does 360 degrees amount to nothing? If you do rotate 360 degrees, is it the same as if you'd, you hadn't rotated at all? Always, regardless of how symmetrical or asymmetrical the object is. If so, then you're probably doing rotation, or it's a good guess. So, for example, if you're rotating a cylinder in 3D, I actually kind of wanted a closed, a, a solid cylinder here, but it's actually nice to have the axis too, so I, I took this picture. So um, you're rotating this cylinder in three dimensions. Let's imagine it's a solid cylinder, like a salt, a jar of molten, molten salt or something like that. And you're rotating it, then... Um, it's not exactly the same as rotating a circle in the plane because the object is not a circle. It's a three-dimensional block. But everybody would recognize that it shares an incredible affinity with rotating a circle in the plane, partly because you have the same formal rules. For example, if I go around 360 degrees, then it's going to look exactly the same, even if it has markings on it. Um, now, if I look at just the top edge of the thing, there's a circle around the top rim of the thing. That is much, much closer to just being, hey, that is rotating a circle. Um, and so that's a, a, that it's, you're acting in, in a way that you're rotating a cylinder, but you're also rotating a circle. You're rotating the circle around the middle. You're rotating the circle around the bottom. You're acting on all the different parts of the object in subtly different ways, but that all share the same idea that it's rotation. An, e an interesting example is that the axis of the thing, right through the middle of the cylinder, you're not doing anything to that. Even if you rotate 17.3 degrees, the rest of the object has been rotated. If it had marks on it, you could tell. But I'm acting trivially on this axis. So one of the weird things is that I can be rotating and, uh, and doing nothing. And that's going to be kind of a simplistic, uh, degenerate case, but it, 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 it turns out to be important. So there's different ways. That the upshot here is that rotation, uh, the same kind of group of symmetries with cer certain formal rules, it can act in different ways, more and more or less complicated ways. And in fact, sometimes it can just act in a st really stupid, very uncomplicated way, not doing anything. So here's a huge mathematical achievement that I'm just going to summarize vaguely and in one slide. It's a, a back to that subject of classification. You could imagine that if I look at all the possible formal rules for symmetries, how they could interact with each other, it could just be a bewildering infinite complexity that could never be understood. But luckily, that's not true. And in fact, it's one of the things that's best understood of all kinds of mathematical classification endeavors. There's sort of three uh, different kinds of quest classification questions that are basically fully understood. And some of them required, say, 20 or 30 years of work. Some are required much, much more. The possible groups of continuous symmetries. Continuous here is actually a good thing. It helps you uh, uh, analyze them. All the things where you can sort of turn it on slowly and deform them, like rotating a circle. All those groups, they're not all understood completely, but the building blocks of those groups, they can be broken down into building blocks, somewhat like uh, elements, you know, compounds into atoms, atoms into, into protons and neutrons, that kind of thing. Um, those building blocks are full, fully understood. And in fact, this is a picture of a diagrammatic picture that systematizes all of those building blocks. That's it. Um, there's there's different there's a few families A B C D and then there's a few examples that aren't in those families and that is it. How those guys can act 
in a certain sense, which I won't make precise, um, how they can act are also, the building blocks of those are fundamentally understood. That's called representation theory. How those, how those things interact with each other, not completely understood, lots of interesting questions. And if you don't look at continuous symmetries, it actually turns out to make it harder in a way. Um, but if you look at discrete symmetries, and if you just say that uh, you look at something where it's a finite group, where there's only a finite set of ways you can modify something, the building blocks of those are understood as well. Again, when you combine them, it gets more complicated. But um, this is called the classification of finite simple groups, and it was an unbelievably huge achievement of a lot, a lot of people. Um, and it comes up with all kinds of interesting stuff. So that's uh, a tremendous achievement that um, is, has a lot of relevance to physics because symmetry is going to be, we're going to see it's so important to physics. And also this, this, this wonderful affinity that uh, it's a classification, sort of like the, the physicists have classified things into, um, they've said the world is complicated not because it has so many different kinds of stuff, it's because it has very few different kinds of stuff, but they interact in complicated ways possible. So the, the upshot of that is the foundations of symmetry theory are very well understood. There's still many, many interesting questions, though. And so, for, for example, something that looks a bit complicated, this is a diagram that represents the most complicated kind of symmetry. It's called E8, the most complicated kind of basic fundamental symmetry. And it gives you, it, 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 it's a diagram that represents, um, that you use in order to figure out all the different ways it can act. So it comes up in the representation theory of E8. Um, and it's just a very cool, pretty picture from Wikipedia. And in, that's a good place to stop uh, section. In the next section, we'll go back to physics.